God is good and is certainly worthy of all the praise. And we're grateful for him. Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We honor your holy and your precious name. And we're thankful, Lord. We are truly, truly thankful for what you're going to do and what you're going to say on tonight. Father, we thank you, Lord. We want to be all that you've designed us to be, Lord. We do, Father. We want to be all that you designed us to be. And we thank you. Amen. Um, I want to talk to you uh, a little bit tonight. I want to study some stuff or talk about some things that we, again, we feel that is important for the next level. But we want to also, as in the next couple of weeks, I think, in the next couple of weeks, if the Lord uh, doesn't change, in the next couple of weeks, we want to talk about some things that we feel that um, we have to be aware of as believers to make sure it doesn't uh, infiltrate or doesn't cause us um, to uh, to miss it. And we also want to want to recognize, be able to recognize some things that's manifesting around us so we can pull it down and pray against it. So it either won't, uh, um, and we used to talk about this years ago, but we don't talk much about it now because I, I don't think believers believe that this can happen, but it can certainly happen and it's called transferring of spirits. And so we want to be careful. And I remember one of one of the best illustrations I think that 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 um, that well, that comes to mind right quick is the one that um, Pastor Flowers talked about some years ago. Um, I remember uh, she was talking about one time she uh, she went on this job and she was going to work and she liked her job. Yes, I did. And she was in there getting ready to go go to work and somebody came up to her was on her job and said, "God, I hate being here." Or something in that in that incident. And before, before she knew it, she, I think she almost caught herself, caught it, she, that came to her mind about what was wrong with the job. If we're not careful, y'all, if we don't keep our minds set to where our path is, stay in our lane, somebody can transfer an attitude on you. Because sometimes it sounds reasonable. You may have, there may have been a t- time, you may have went on a job or gotten a job, and it may have been some time on that job that you've gotten frustrated. Mm-hmm. But you got over it. You dealt with it. And then after you get over it, all of a sudden someone who may be going through the season that you've gone through, and don't know how to handle it, will come up with the attitude that you used to have. You got over it. You got frustrated with the job. You wanted to quit. You wanted to walk away. But you got past that. You got over it. But then someone else who's now going in that same season, following those same footsteps that you have, now comes to you and relates to you the attitude that you used to have. I used to want to leave here. I used to want to quit. I used to didn't like this job. I used to didn't like that, you know, and stuff. And you've gotten past it and you realize, you know, I can't let the things that I cannot change interfere with the things that's supposed to change me, my relationship with God or so forth and so on. I can't let other things change me. And you got past it. You dealt with it and stuff. If it was a conflict with a, with a boss or an employee or employer or whatever it may be, you dealt with it. And you got past it. And then someone else comes right behind you and stuff and they speak to you what you've gotten past. And if you're not careful, you'll fly right back to that moment as if you didn't get past it and you repeat what they're saying to you. Amen? Or sometimes we think it's okay to narrate something because I don't know if we think we're sharing something with them to overcome, but make sure you actually have gotten past it so that when they say it, it doesn't hit a spot. You, you, you see what I'm saying? Someone says to you, well, you were frustrated and you got past it. Remember, not trying to be redundant. You got past it and you're no, no longer frustrated. And they say to you, oh, God, I'm sick of this job. Well, I'm tired of this and stuff. And you get frustrated and stuff and you listen to it and it hits you here and you share with them. I know how you feel because I used to be like that. You have to honestly be used to. Mm-hmm. You know, you can't share it with them because, you know, you think you're giving a message to encourage them when your attitude is still there. Yeah. You may not be manifesting it as fresh as it was, but it's still there. It doesn't generate an empowering. It generates a frustration again, but you just don't live there. You're visiting. Mm-hmm. Amen. So, you know, it's like visiting a restaurant you got sick at and stuff and you look at the menu and stuff and you think about getting something and then someone else is standing there, remind you how they got sick, but they're going to try it again. And you think, I remember I got, I'm not going to be in the, even in the restaurant. I'm not even going to hear someone else's testimony. And if you made me sick the first time, you may kill me the next, so I'm not going back again. So that's the same thing about anything that we don't keep visiting something and stuff or don't share something with someone if you're not all the way out. That shows a sign that if it hits you, it hits a spot in your life, you're not finished with it. Amen? Amen. So what we want to do, y'all, we want to always investigate uh, the, uh, the character presentation that we're having before God. We want to make sure it's something that we can live with if God leaves us there. Amen? Amen? And we don't want God to leave us somewhere he can't use us at. We want God to always, God, deliver me. Tell me about me. Open me up to me. Open me up to your truth. Open me up to whatever word you need to open up so I can be better at what you've called me to do. Amen? Amen. Listen to this. Turn your Bibles. Amen. 
I don't want, and I'm going to slow down because I, I was going a little fast then. I don't want anything to get in the way of God in my relationship. I, I don't. And this is not in regards, y'all, listen to me. I, this is not in regards to what peop, about people. This is in regards sometimes the first one that I'm putting on trial is me. Amen. I don't want me to get in the way. Amen. Because I got to go home with me. Now, you, you could do something to make me upset. I'll leave you. I can leave you right there. Mm-hmm. You could say something to me that hurt my feelings right here. I'm, I'm not staying. I don't live here. I come here for church. I don't live here. So I can go home. And I, but me, if I don't deal with how I do me, because I'm always going to be with me. Mm-hmm. I can't leave me here. Mm-hmm. I can't just say, I'm, I, I, I can't say to me, I quit you. Because I'm, I'm going to go everywhere I go. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to make sure I deal with me first. So that the enemy won't have anything to work on from me against me. But there's some questions that we'll ask later. I don't know if we'll get to it tonight. But one of the questions asked, do you know that the enemy can use you against you? Jesus. Do you know that? Do you know the enemy can use you against you? Yeah. Enemy can make you do a job on your own self. Mm-hmm. And sometimes we don't realize how much, how much of the job the enemy has done on us. Listen to this. We don't know how much a job the enemy has done on us using us against ourselves until we realize or feel that we are by ourselves. When we feel that we, when we realize how much we are by ourselves, that's not so much because people don't like you. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you did so much a job on yourself that you just isolate your own self. And y'all, sometimes we don't realize how much of a job we did on ourselves, isolating ourselves until after we're isolated. Mm-hmm. Then we realize, man, I done did a job on me. I done taught myself right out of every potential that God has called me to. Mm-hmm. Amen. So we have to be careful. We have to be careful of the characteristics that cause us to work against ourselves. And we have to know when we're doing a job on ourselves. Don't, let's not lie to us. Come on. Let's not lie. You, you, don't pinch yourself and say somebody else did it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Come on. Don't trip yourself and say somebody else put their foot in front of you. Know when and be honest when it's you that's doing the job on you. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying you shouldn't be, you shouldn't be aware when other people are trying to transfer or doing, trying to do a job on you. You should always be aware of that. But please don't close your eyes to what you're doing to yourself. Wow. And the most important thing is don't give credit to the enemy when it's yours, when it's you. Wow. Sometimes we pass the power to the enemy of something that, that we've exercised the power against our own selves for. God, the enemy sure enough trying to make me feel discouraged. No, 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 no. You bought into discouragement. And be, be, to be honest, and let's put power and authority where it belongs. All the enemy can actually do is present us something. Because remember, we're, we already belong to God. The only way we can become something that we ought not be is when we buy into it. When it sounds reasonable. You, you listen, you will never become stupid until you believe that you're dumb. Wow, that's true. Come on. That's true. When you buy into it, that all the mistakes, you know, you know how sometimes you find yourself, there's sometimes throughout a day or just sometimes every once in a while, every once in a while, season comes. So down, Pops, flowers, okay. Every once in a while, moments come where you just feel like you're just tripping on yourself. You're just doing stuff. Have you ever, I, I did it tonight. I didn't say anything to myself. I normally would. Tonight, I was getting ready to leave. And I was cutting off. I had this, this uh, warmer thing that lets off scents. Sense. And I had some books in front of it. Those books uh, that, that you got me. I had those books in front of it. And I was trying to reach past the books to get to the candle warmer or wax warmer to turn it off. And I ended up flipping the wax warmer. And it spread all on the table and all on, 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 on my books. I was so frustrated with me. And I was just getting ready to call me something. Come on. Come on. I was just getting ready to talk about, God, slow down. Stop being clumsy. You can't, listen, we can't title a moment as if it's a lifetime inheritance and not expect it to take some control in our life. That is true. Amen. You'll never, we'll never become stupid until we believe we're stupid, until we believe we're dumb. You'll, listen, you can't take a moment and call yourself. I said something one time to someone. Someone called them a name. Someone called them a name. Called them something that wasn't them. They titled them something that was, that was really not good. And they said, I ain't thinking about them. I ain't, even, I ain't thinking about them. I said, you didn't say anything? I said, I ain't thinking about them because you know how they are. They, no, they, just, they just run them out. I said, no, no, you can't let things hang out there like that. That's right. You can't let people say things that's going to attach to a characteristic that sometimes you may, you may find yourself struggling with that you normally would not struggle with. You say, why is all this, why is this happening? There was a young man one time, and his, he was growing up, and his family kept calling him a name that meant that he had a feeble mind, mm-hmm. that he was not stable in his mind. Mm-hmm. And 
After a while, they gave him that name as a nickname. And he wore that nickname like it was a badge of, you know, this is, this is an expression of, of y y y your love. This is an expression of, you know, that you care about me. And he carried that name. I don't want to say the name because somebody listening who may be part of somebody's family who may be listening to this may know who I'm talking about. And I just don't, I don't want to do that. But they call him the name. Well, he grew up, y'all. This boy was intelligent. He went to, I forget the name, uh, uh, MIT. MIT school. Except it is. I mean, he did an awesome job, but his mind was not stable enough to control his behavior, all because he bought into what his family was saying he was. That's right. Amen? That's why we can't just hold on to words and stuff and not think they're not going to have any power. The scripture even says there's power in our tongue. There was this, this uh, married couple, and this man, this man kept telling his, his wife, call, he called, I don't want to say that word either. Man, I, I, well, let me just say this word, but that's not what he said. He said, you stupid. He said, you, but he used another word that it, when he used that word, it, uh, it, it sounded like he was joking. But it meant the same thing as you're stupid. You're incompetent. You, you can't, you can't do anything right. You're just dumb. And he kept saying it to her and he said it to her over years. Not just one moment. He said it to her over years, especially when, when he get around people and she would make a mistake. He would call her that. Mm -hmm. And then he would invite other people to call her, call her into it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and stuff. And then years went by and a period of time came where the ministry started getting serious in her life. And he needed her help to do some things. And every time she put her hands to assist him in the stuff, she'd mess it up. Yeah. He would get frustrated with her. And he would wonder, why is it that this person can ask you to do something and you do it right? And I ask you to do something and you seem to mess it up. See, what we don't seem to understand is whether it's you or whether it's somebody else in your life. If you unemploy yourself towards, towards yourself, no wonder you mess up when it always comes to you. But what he didn't understand is the reason why she was proficient to them and not to him was because he disemployed her. Yes, he did. He made her stupid towards him. And so she was always on edge. She was, she was never able to carry a full thought to, towards the things that he asked her to do because he told her, you, you, you're dumb. You don't have the capability of finishing anything. And that's the title he gave her. So even to ourselves, y'all, there are some things, yes, we can get frustrated with ourselves, but watch what you say. Amen. Because that's going to build a characteristic in your life. That's going to make a character out of you. You're going to find yourself stumbling over things that you ought to be proficient and victorious in. But it's how you say it to yourself. Amen? Amen. And don't just title yourself because someone else sees it in you. Mm -hmm. Or because someone else thinks they see it in you. Amen. You see what I mean? And, when I, and when I don't mean see it in you. They may think they see it in you. And even if it is in you, don't hold on to it as if you have to live with it. Amen? Amen? If you see me mess up, then I'm going to clean up my mess up. So don't title me as a mess up. Mm -hmm. Amen? That's why we have to even be careful in, in, with our kids in school. I'm saying this, even in school. There are some times that kids may have challenges in school, but you watch out how they label them. And you watch out how you get frustrated with them when they bring you that label. Amen. You know, your child's messed up in school. You get on my nerves with your dumb self. Wait, watch out. You trying to you're asking a dummy to be intelligent. That, that's, now, that's your words. You're telling this dummy to be smart. What parent with that authority and that covering you're entitling that child to be dumb smart. They, those two don't go together. That's right. Now, either you're going to empower them to be smart or you're going to empower them to be dumb. Mm -hmm. But it's up to you what you release in that child's life and encourage in that child's life, regardless of what the challenges they may be going through. Well, my child does have, my child does have some problems. Well, then, uh, listen, pray those, pray those problems through. Empower them. I tell you, no, no child, I, I don't know, no child had no more problems going through school than myself. I don't know any child, and I'm, talk, and I'm sure it was. I, I had a study problem. I did not know how to study. I could not study and stuff. You know, I wrote just to get past, but, you know, get past things. I wrote, I could write stories because I, I could think of stories. But as far as being able to study and put that study into action, no, that wasn't me. That wasn't me. But can you imagine if my mom and them had, now she said some things about, you know, the old wives' tales. But if she had to call me dumb, my, if, if anybody called me dumb in school, my mom was going out there. Was, my mom wasn't nice when she showed up at places. I mean, she would say those kind of words that you duck your head. 
You know, and all you can do, and you but not when she's in that mode. I don't know if anybody ever had a parent like this. If she's on that role, only thing you better do is just sit back and be quiet, <laughs> because you don't want to be part of that. <laughs> you know, cause you, you try to stop her, then you're part of it. You're part. Of it. So I just <laughs> let it go on and stuff. And I ain't worried about nobody teasing, cause she'll come back and do them too. So I just <laughs> and stuff. But you ain't gonna call me dumb. You can call her stupid and stuff. Yes, we, yes, I struggle. But you ain't, you ain't gonna you ain't gonna, you ain't, you ain't gonna label me. My mom didn't allow that. And y'all, we need to have that same defense for ourselves. And some of us still tell, us, tell ourselves we're stupid. Some of us still are frustrated, but we still get frustrated with ourselves. And I know sometimes pride gets in the way. Well, I don't ever say that to myself. Stop lying. When you get mad, you start saying things to yourself you know you ought not say. Amen. Sometimes we learn how to dress them up. I, I, I ain't going to say I'm stupid, but I might say, God, I'm, boy, I've been glad when I can start doing things right. Does it sound prettier, doesn't it? But it still means the same thing. Amen. Start claiming some things that, that benefits you going forward, not keep you where you're at. Amen. So again, we're in this teaching, we want to deal with some characters in the Bible that may look like some of us in the church. We have to deal with it. There are some characteristics that if you put them in leadership, they'll, they'll make a shipwreck out of the church. There are some characteristics that's in our life as believers. We'll make a shipwreck out of our vision, out of our purpose and out of our design. We want to make sure we clean up things so what we present to, towards God and what that anointed presents towards God, God can use. Amen. Does that make sense? Amen. No matter where you're starting from. No matter, no matter how many scriptures you remember from this point on and stuff, believe yourself to be better. Believe yourself to be more proficient. Believe yourself, listen to this word, believe yourself to be more excellent. Amen? Amen. And when you believe yourself to be more excellent and you walk in the, thank you, and you walk in the spirit of excellence and stuff, you'll find yourself being more successful in a lot of things, even in your thinking. Amen? Amen? Amen. Listen to this. The Lord pronounced us more than able, and I want you to hear these two words, and I want you to remember these two words. The Lord has pronounced us more than able and capable. Now, uh, as I was looking at these two words, um, there's no strict rules or laws when it comes to using either one of these two words. But there is a, is a law of application if you really want to be proficient when you use these two words. When you use the word able, it is, it is dealing with what you have at hand that you're able to do, that you can be successful and proficient in. When you talk about the word capable, it's not talking about right now. It's some of the things that you will meet later that you have the ability, the strength, and the anointed wisdom or whatever you need to be successful in it. So God has already pronounced us to be not only able, he's pronounced us to be capable. He's pronounced us to be to deal with and be successful in whatever we're being challenged by or dealing with now. He's also empowered and will empower us to deal with whatever may challenge us tomorrow. Amen. And I don't mean just in the 24-hour period. I mean what's coming after, after us or coming at us or challenging us a little bit later. Amen? Turn your Bibles again. Let's go to Romans. You may be already there. Romans chapter 8, verse 37. And I don't want us to take this lightly. Sometimes we hear scriptures over and over again, and we have the tendency sometimes to take these scriptures lightly because they sound normal. They become a normal sounding, sounding uh, sound in our ears. And I don't want us to, and I encourage you to never, I don't want us to ever take any scripture because we've heard it many times lightly. Amen? Amen. Or think just because it becomes a norm in our hearing that it should be that it should be a norm in our spirit. That there's nothing new or more revelatory that comes from that scripture just because we heard it. Amen? Amen. Romans 8 and 37 tells us what? That we're more than conquerors, doesn't it? Amen. And sometimes we listen to that scripture and stuff, and we don't truly, I don't think we truly understand or take the power that what that scripture is saying. And that scripture talks about just what we were saying, use the word able and capable. It talks about, let, let's deal with whatever issues or challenges that I have to exercise authority over. Right now, I have the ability to do it because God says I'm more than a conqueror. Amen? Through Christ Jesus who loves me. Through his love, he's made me more than, he's made me more than a conqueror. Not only just to deal with what's in front of me, but to deal with what's coming up from behind me, coming from what's on the side of me, or coming from what's in front of me. He's given me that ability. And I don't need to fear what's coming next because God has given me the capability to, fe- to face it with force and win. Isn't it awesome? Amen. It's awesome? You know, sometimes we're afraid we get these battles. You hear people think, you know, they use two words and two words invoke these kind of fears. One, you talk about patience. Then people seem to think just because you have patience, all of a sudden trials come. You know what really actually happens? You know how somebody says, you know, you, have you ever cut yourself and didn't know it? And all of a sudden you look, oh man, I'm bleeding. And then when you recognize all of a sudden, it hurts. <laughs> but before you knew it, it didn't hurt. Right. But after you recognize, and then uh, now, now all of a sudden you get anxious because you're bleeding. <laughs> Before you saw the blood, you didn't know it, didn't bother you. But after you saw the blood, it starts to hurt, and now the, all that blood like that. <laughs> See, that's the same thing with faith when you talk about patience. 
Only thing that happens is when you intensify your desire to be patient and hold yourself up, it feels like the trial is greater. And it's not. It's just that you're intensifying holding the reins back more, not being anxious, not feeling threatened that nothing is going to happen. Amen. But before you had patience, before you worked on patience, guess what would happen? When things didn't come quick, you just got upset. That was your release. You just got upset. You got fr- When is this thing going to happen? I'm getting sick and tired of waiting on this thing. That was your release. You didn't have this. There was no discipline to hold or restrain your mouth or your feelings. Come on. So it didn't feel like you, it, you didn't feel like you were holding back. But when you have to hold back on something, when you can't release those feelings, when you can't release that frustration, everything has to come under discipline. It feels like the trial is greater. And it's really not. It's just you just not let yourself loose to say and feel anything. Amen? Amen. So the enemy tricks us and people have tricked us with these sayings. If you ask for patience, you're going to have more trials. That's not true. That's not true. That's not true. Amen. And another thing is sometimes y'all things happen and then another thing happens and another thing happens and stuff. And, and you get control of those things and you win in these things. And all of a sudden the enemy tells you, don't relax because something else is going to happen. Hmm. And still taking your, taking your, taking your history events. If I handle it here, if I handle it here, if I handle it here, why can't I handle it there? Why should I get over anxious when, my, when God's experience with me or me, my experience with God has showed me that no matter what comes, I am more than a conqueror. Amen. No matter what comes, God has given me a short victory, especially when, especially when I trust him and I rest in him. When I put my mind on Christ Jesus, he abides with me. I abide in his peace. Yes. Amen. But the enemy wants to get us, get us. Don't ask for patience. And then when things start to happen, you know, these wives tell, you know, things happen in three. <laughs> I forget, you know, sometimes people on, they, they get on social media and somebody, and, and somebody I, I don't know what, they, I don't know why they think this is something that, mm, God, it's something that should be said. Like, you know, somebody dies and then somebody else died. They say, well, you know, they come in threes. Oh, really? Biblical, show me. <laughs> So that, what they start looking for, still looking for somebody to get healed or somebody to get delivered, looking for somebody else to die. Mm-hmm. Listen to this. Don't let the enemy motivate you or transfer on you to look for something that you have the power to change. Come on. Amen? Amen? Here we go. Look at this. Romans 8.37, Amplified Virgin says, Yet amid all these things now, uh, if you've ever read... Um, all of Romans leading up to this 37th verse, you see a litany of things that Paul starts to outline. He starts to outline the trials. He starts to outline uh, 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 things coming against them. Start to outline how the enemy tries to convince them that they can sna- he can snatch them out of the love of God, out of the plan of God, out of the resources of God and stuff and set them on, a, on, in a, a, on an island of, of no hope and no help and stuff. And, and, and all these things, these challenges come. And then Paul gets here to 37th verse and says, wait a minute, hold up. All these things that you got to go through, from 1 to 36, all these things you got to go through, all these challenges that come, all these things that come in your life. He said, amidst all these things, we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus that loves us. Yes. Amen. So what, 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 what am I saying here, talking about the, the generalization of this message? We should never let anything change our character towards God so it looks like we want to fail. Look like we feel like we have no choice. No matter what God has done for us, no matter what God has empowered us to do, we have no choice. We have no resources to weigh out. God has not planned uh, uh, anything for a change and stuff. We should never have a character, have a characteristics in our life or carry a character that shows that we don't trust God. Amen. Amen. God is good. Listen to this. In the um, basic Bible, English says this, Romans 8, 37. But we are able to overcome all these things and more. Deal with the word able and capable through his love. Listen to this. The Lord not only decreed our victory for the things that are at hand, but also for the challenges to come. I like that. I like that, Pastor Flowers. The Lord, not, the Lord has not only decreed our victory for the things that are at hand, but also the challenges to come. We do not have to spend the rest of our life being a victim uh, to issues, struggles, and bondages that want to present us to the will of God as an underachiever, as rebellious, as pretenders, as weaklings, and disingenuous. We don't want any characteristics in our life to present us in any other way other than God. I want your will to be fulfilled. Yes. Amen? Amen. But this starts with, listen to this, but this starts with a fight to put to death the character of contradictions that exist in our life. It starts from us having the desire and a want to put to death the characters of, characteristics of contradiction that, that exists in our life. Mm-hmm. Amen? Amen. 
Many believers spend much effort, and I need us to listen to this one. Many believers spend much effort to modify what they're actually, uh, what they're, what they're actually a consistent prey to instead of mortifying the source of their behavior. Mm-hmm. Many of us would rather, rather modify what's actually going on in our life than to mortify the source of their behavior. Whatever that causes, you, causes us to be susceptible or prey to whatever issues and bondages that continue to exist in our life and stuff. We can't just modify. We can't just be good without dealing with what makes us bad. Does that make sense? If we don't deal with what makes us bad, all we'll do is for moments pretend like we're okay. Amen? And we don't want to be that. We don't want to be believers that, 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 that are only good when we're, in the front of, when we're in front of people. Come on. I, I don't want to not display an a, a attitude or behavior that's, that I should not display or show only when I'm in front of people. Mm-hmm. I want to I be good and stuff when I'm by myself. Because I don't want to certainly, I certainly don't want to make my own self feel uncomfortable. Right, right. I don't want to be where I can't even trust my own self by myself. Right. Amen? Amen? And you hear people many times say, I don't trust me. Man, that's a set, that's an uncomfortable life when you can't even trust you with you. Because you don't know, you know, I, there's some people that I wouldn't get in the car with. There's a guy, I was growing up in, uh, in Lewis, there was a guy that everybody got in the car. This is real. I, I can't say his name, but it was a guy. I can't say his name, but I'm not going to say his name and stuff. It was a guy, every, every person that got in the car with him, he had an accident with him and they died. Oh, my God. He lived right on the, right on the corner of the same street. I lived on, on DuPont Avenue. Mm-hmm. And right down the end, he, they, his family and them lived down there. They had, some, they had some money. But every time he got in the car and stuff, he had an accident with somebody. When he went, when they rode with him, and they died, mm-hmm. and I've often said, if I was, it was raining and thunder and lightning, mm-hmm. and he came by to pick me up, I take my chance with thunder and lightning. Yes, sir. Oh, Amen. Right. Some of us are just like that with our own personal lives. We're even too afraid to get in, a, get in, get in a spiritual ride with our own selves because mm-hmm. we just don't trust ourselves. Because for the most part, let's be honest. Can we be honest on both on both sides? Because for the most part, we've gotten in accidents for ourselves, for ourselves. We've wrecked ourselves, and some of it is because of the language and attitude that we carry concerning God's investment in our own life. If many of us in the body of Christ would be honest, if many of us would be honest in the body of Christ, we would tell the truth about how we actually feel about us. Not how you feel about me, but how you feel about you. I'm not saying everybody's in this position. Somebody say with me, everybody's not in this position. And everybody is not at a high degree of dislike, distrust, and uneasiness with themselves. Everybody's not at that high degree. But some of us at some degree do have an uneasiness about ourselves that we have to solve. Amen. Amen? Amen. Because if we don't solve that, no matter what, you, what God gives you to try to encourage and empower you, you will always question it based on how you feel about yourself handling this thing. Amen? So, so the question is, let me ask this question before I go on, because I got to go on. I'm not going to be long before you. The question we need to ask ourselves is, if the scripture says that we will know the tree, you'll hear me say the scripture again, we know the tree by the fruit it bears, then we need to ask ourselves, if we're not bearing fruit, what is the character of your tree? I want you to think about that. I'm not going to bring it to you tonight, but think about it. If the scripture says we're known by, uh, the tree is known by the fruit it bears, if there is no fruit being bared, what kind of tree are you? Wow. Wow. Think about it. Okay. I'm, I'm not, not going to answer it yet. Okay. Amen. Isn't God good? Yeah, awesome. Colossians. Chapter 3. Let me, while you're going, let me finish reading this. Many believers, and I, I did hit, hit this earlier, but let me go over this again. Let me hit this last uh, sentence again. Many believers spend much effort to modify what they are actually a constant prey to instead of mortifying the source of that behavior. I don't care what it is, y'all, that causes us to manifest whatever we're manifesting. If it is a constant, it has become a characteristic in our life. We can't just say it's, we can't just say it's not a part of us when it, constantly, when it constantly has power and influence over how we act. And it's just not, and let me make this clear. It's not just how you act that I can see or how I act that you can see. 
is how you act that anybody, including yourself, can see. Amen? Amen. That's what makes it a troubling estimation, if I can say that, of being a characteristic or character in our life. Somebody tell me, anybody can tell me what character means? Any behavior, trait, behavior, attitude that identifies you to be either different or like a certain group. Anything that identifies you with or against a certain group. Amen? Here we go. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. If when, if then be risen, if ye then be risen. That's what I make sure I'm reading the King James Version. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections mm -hmm. on things above. Let me say that again. Set your affections on things above and not on things on the earth. Now, I, I need you to understand that when Paul wrote this to the Colossians church, they were spiritually apt. They understood what it means to serve, serve God. But here's what Paul was dealing with. That most times believers can speak in tongues, but they can't hear God's tongue back that motivates a behavior that, or that endorses or encourages a strong spiritual walk. Sometimes God wants this as much as he wants this. Amen. 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 The strongest believers are the believers that have a passion towards the things of God. Amen. I mean, have a passion. See, we, what, the scripture says um, our, our greatest efforts will be where our heart is at. We'll fight for where our heart is at. Mm -hmm. We'll defend where our heart's at. Mm -hmm. And stuff. We can, we'll try to pray away the things that distract us in the spirit. If our heart is not connected to it. But when our heart is connected to it, so the, a fight follows it. Whatever you care for, your heart, your fight follows it. When we have a passion towards it. And that's what God, God wants. And we, I think we was talking about this on last week. God just didn't want, don't just want you speaking in tongues. He doesn't just want you having a spiritual aspect of the things of a relationship. He wants you to have a heart passion towards it too. Not just following your feelings, but a, a passion that makes you fight for it. Because you're connected to it. Or else he would not have said, wherever your heart is, so is your connection, so is your attention, so is your focus. Your focus will always be where your heart is at. Whatever, what, whatever we care and invest in the most of our feelings, passion, and emotions into, and stuff, and spiritual life and stuff, we fight for it. That's where attention goes at. Some of us say, and it's a reality, and it's not, just, it's not just carnal when we say it. We don't just base it on it. Some of us say, gosh, you know, I know God exists, but I just can't. I get in, I get praised in and stuff, and I just can't. I see them, I see people like they're feeling it, but I just don't feel it. And some of us are awesome and discouraged because we know, we, we, we know there is a God, and we pray, and sometimes we we're, get right on the edge where it feels like, oh, man, I'm going to enter into a realm that I never entered in before. I'm going to feel something I've never felt before, and then we then get dis distracted and back up. Amen. Amen. I guarantee you. You'll never stay in a relationship with anybody or anything that you have no passion for. That's true. Amen? Mm -hmm. All right, here we go. Colossians, finishing it. Verse 2, Colossians 3, starting to verse, going at, hitting verse 2. Set your affections again on things above and not on things on the earth. Your attention, your spiritual attention, your emotional attention, your real mind and emotions, all those things. Verse 3 says, For ye are dead. And your life is hid with Christ in God. Isn't that amazing that he would say, set your affections on things above and on things beneath. But then he says in verse 3, for you are dead and your life is hid in Christ. How that sound like a, sound like a contradiction, doesn't it? When he says, set your affections, then it says, but you are dead. Why is this? It's directional. It's directional. He's saying, set your affections on things above that you can live. But if you abide on the things below, then your death is most exacerbated. Can I say that word? So we're going to set up that death. If we want life, then we set our affections on things above. If we want to stay in that death, then guess what? We stay here. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Here we go. Verse 4 says, so when, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. Mm. 
Verse 5 says, mortify. Can, can anybody tell me, just guesstimation. Can anybody tell me what, 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 what he mean by here about mortify? I kind of, I think I may even said it or hit, hit to it. Can anybody tell me? Kill them. Oh. See? Okay, is that it? Eradicate it. Okay. Distance yourself from it. Not let it be a part of your character. Absolutely. Get rid of it. Get rid of or it. Or put it, or at least put it to death. Yes. Let me show you, let me, can I show you a good phrase? Anybody ever got a two pull? Yes. Uh, what did, you, you see that needle they put in your gum? Unfortunately, yes. Mm. God. And when they start to put it in your gum, you feel it. Yeah. And it doesn't feel like it ever ends. Yes. I mean, they start, yes. And, they, and some, uh, some dentists don't have any tag. They show it to you. Okay, look, this may have a little pinch. And you're looking at it like, no, this is going to have more than a pinch. Yeah. And stuff. And it, and it pinches it in and it goes in there and all of a sudden, stuff, all, everything goes numb. Then they, tell, they open your mouth and sometimes they put these things to keep your mouth open. And stuff, and that, 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 that's really uncomfortable. And stuff, and then he goes in and he starts pulling the tooth. You can feel that he's pulling that tooth, but it doesn't hurt. You can feel that he's in your mouth with, that, with those tools, with that pliers or whatever he got in there. He's, and, he's, and then sometimes they use that drill, you know, that, that craftsman drill, drill, they in there. Craftsman <laughs> drill. And you can feel him. And some, I've gotten to, and you feel like yanking. They be yanking, but it doesn't hurt. But guess when it does hurt? After the, the, the numbing thing goes away, all of a sudden it, it hurts. See, and this is where believers mess up at. They mess it up at the beginning because they won't, let, they won't let God help them to mortify or deaden. So that when he works on those areas, that, the, that, that thing that's not dead is mastering in and stuff and pulls it out and stuff. We, we won't let God deaden those areas so we won't feel the pain of him pulling it out. Now, we will feel the pain of missing it after it's gone. But it's our job, y'all, to realize that it's going, it's, it's going is best for us. Because I certainly don't want the pain that the tooth gave me. Because I know if I kept it in, it ain't going away. I can drug it. I can drug myself up. I can do a whole lot of stuff to make, make, you know, make me out of this world. But it never gets rid of the pain that that thing in there is causing. When I get rid of it. And sometimes, again, the numbing, mortifying, deadening it, causing it to have no power and influence, have no fear that this, it can do more than it can do. After I go through that process, then all that's finished afterwards, and when that numbing goes away, I feel the loss of it. But my job is to realize the loss of it is my gain. Amen. That's it. Amen. Yeah. You know, the things that you couldn't eat, the things that you could not eat while that tooth was there, mm-hmm. after a couple of weeks or so, when the area that's being pulled up, has been made strong, now you can go to eating the things that you used to cut not could eat. Mm-hmm. Amen? Here we go. Mortify therefore your members, verse 5. Colossians 3 says, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affections, evil uh, conspicuous, y'all know that word, covetousness, which is adultery. You know, I like this word, uh, inordinate affections. That means when the enemy supersedes what is normal to feel about something, and it makes it abnormal, out of your control, mm. out of your discipline. Mm-hmm. Amen? Amen. Verse six: Which uh, which things which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. Verse seven says, reading on down, in which you also walk sometimes when you lived in them, but now you are also you are also put off all these anger. Wrath. Now they talked about the things that you have to mortify. Now, if you're mortifying, you get the strength and the ability. Now you can put these things off, such as anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communications out of your mouth. That means filthy communications, not just talking nasty. Filthy communications is how you say things that you ought not say, or these kind of words that come out of your mouth ought not be said that you said not only towards somebody else, but you say towards yourself. Mm-hmm. Amen? Amen. Filthy communication is something that's unwholesome or not winsome. You can't get any victories from it. You can't get any success from it. And you certainly can't promote from it. Amen? Amen. Listen to this. Verse 9 says, Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his, with, uh, with his deeds. Verse 10 says, And having put on a new man, which is renewed in the knowledge after the image of him that created him. Again, verse 10. And have put on, put, put on the new man, which is renewed in the knowledge after the image of him that created him. 
Verse 11 says, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian or Sicilian, bond or free, but Christ is all in all. Now here we go. But, but put therefore as a let God, holy beloved bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness and long suffering. Without these, you'll continue to be transferred on and call yourself things, things that God has not called you. Amen. Isn't God good? Let me move on. Listen to this. The apostle here in Colossians uh, chapter 3. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, anybody else warm besides me? Everybody good? You good? But pastor, you, 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 you tell me you cold early. I'm up here sweating. Listen to this. Here, listen to this in Colossians. The apostle exhorts the Colossians to mortify their flesh, the great hindrance to seeking the things which are above. Since it, is our, since it is our duty to set our affections upon heavenly things, it is our duty to mortify our members, which is upon the earth, which uh, uh, naturally inclines us to things that are here on the earth. Turn your Bibles. Let me see where I want to go. Ezekiel. Chapter 14. I, I got to say to you before, I'm not going to be much longer for you, but I, before you, but I want to say this to you. Many of the passages of God are very serious. Mm -hmm. um, well, all of them are very serious. Oh, but this in dealing with the characters of, you know, characters that we present before God is most serious. This is something we, when we look at this passage, we have to look at where it puts us in a position when we're not mortifying and dealing with the things that present us before God Amen. that God doesn't want. Amen? Amen? So listen to this real clearly, what Ezekiel's dealing with here. And uh, this not only uh, can apply to these men that stood before or came to Ezekiel, mm -hmm. it also applies to us too. And we must be aware of what we're bringing before God with us. Amen. Can I ask you a question? Have, some, have anybody ever said they want to come over your house or they want to meet you somewhere and talk to you and you go and you go to meet them and when you meet them all of a sudden and I'm just all of a sudden you meet them and there's somebody that didn't tell you was coming oh. mm -hmm. and they come right to your house or they come to your house and knocking on the door and you're preparing for just them and they come and knock on your door and you open the door and here they got somebody else with them and you're trying not to your face trying not to change because you're trying to think you told me you need to talk to me about, and I'm preparing to talk to you about with you, and here you got this person. Now I'm gonna have to either modify what we're talking about, or you want to do some other kind of undercover talking. I'm not talking something bad or something, you know, uh, sinful. But now I got to change because I don't know how much you done told them, because you didn't tell me that they were even coming. Now I got to know how much I can say in front of them. See what I'm saying? So here's what we have to do in our character, in, in our characters, when we're presenting ourselves before God. Make sure what you're bringing, God is expecting. Come on. Here we go. Ezekiel chapter 14. New Living Translation. Starting at verse 1. Says this. Then some of the leaders of Israel visited me. And while they were sitting with me, this message came to me from the Lord. Now, these are leaders. Um, and they were coming towards, they were coming to uh, Ezekiel. And they were coming to Ezekiel for answers. Son of man, these leaders have set up idols in their hearts. They put some things in their heart and stuff. They had to dis they, they distract. They had their attention. They had their focus. And guess what, y'all? As we will see as we go on, that these leaders had no intentions to get rid of anything mm -hmm. that God had told them to deal with. Mm -hmm. They had no intentions. They were coming to Ezekiel. They were, seeking, they were seeking the attention of God. They wanted some answers from God and stuff. And they were coming just as they were. And I want you to hear what I just said. They were coming just as they were. And I know a whole lot of times in church, we say come just as you are. And we should. Mm -hmm. But we should come just as we are with an intention to change how we are. Now here's what they did. Here we go. Verse 3 again. Son of man, these leaders have set up idols in their hearts. They have embraced things that will make them fall into sin. They, uh, he, and then he asks 
he's asking Ezekiel, why should I listen to the request? I need you to understand this now. I'm t we're talking about characters later on in this teaching, not tonight. Later on in this teaching, we're going to talk about, I think it's about seven characteristics that manifested in the Bible that turned God off. Mm. Two characteristics that talk about that turn God on, make God want to do things for, for them and stuff. These men came before God. I need us to hear. These men came before God and God looked at them and said, they're coming to you, Ezekiel. They're inquiring of you about me and stuff, but they had no intentions to apply, apply anything I said. And they're certainly not going to stop some of the things they're doing that I told them not to do. Wow. He said, they keep what they're doing. They're, em they're embracing stuff that they know. Can I tell you something? There are some... And I just use people. There are some people I can't. Go, I don't go around because when I go around them, they're so proficient and and seeding trouble that I can find myself arg arguing with them when I shouldn't. So there are some people I have to leave alone. And somebody said, "But well, you don't grow past that." No, there are some people you just have to leave alone until they can grow past that. Yeah. It's not just my job. Now it's my job to live peace with all men. Hold us not, no man shall see the Lord. But if I can't with all my efforts live peacefully with them because of who they are, it's my best job, it's your best job, it's our best job to leave them alone. Amen? Amen. Can I tell you something else too? Oh, I, no, I'll show you here. Um, verse 4 again. Well, verse 3, he said, Ask, should, I, uh, should I listen to their request? God asked him Ezekiel. Verse 4, he said, tell them. This is what the sovereign Lord says. The people of Israel have set up idols in their hearts and fallen into sin. And then they go to the prophets asking for a message. So I, the Lord, will give them the kind of answer their great adultery, adultery deserves. Here's what he's saying. I need, to, I need you to understand. Somewhere, sometimes... No matter how you come, God's going to give you an answer. And that's what he poses before these people. He says they set up, they got, a, they got the adultery is in their heart. They like their idols. They love them. No matter what you do, they are not, and God makes this disposition about them. No matter what is being said, these men are not going to change. And by the way, these men came feeling to represent Israel who was in bondage. Their heart was in bondage. They were asking God trying to give God, get God to give them a positive message to take back to these people. Amen? Mm -hmm. Here we go. Verse 5 says, I will do this to capture the mind and hearts of all my people who have turned from me to worship their detestable idols. Verse 6 says, Therefore, tell the people of Israel, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Repent, and turn away from your idols and stop all your detestable sins. Listen to this. God's dealing with their characteristics. Got to deal with their character because if they don't change their character, he'll do what he says or what he questioned them about when he says, should I, should I listen to them? They have the idols in their heart. They're, they're hugging sins that they know going to make them fall. He says, should I be subject to them? Listen to this. Verse 7. He said, I, the Lord, will answer all those, both Israelites and foreigners, who reject me and set up idols in their hearts and so fall into sin, and who then come to the prophets asking for my advice. I remember there was this man that I was told about. He, um, he, was, he, he, was, just, he was rebellious against the Lord. Um, he did whatever he wanted to do. He was a beastologist. He was, he was, just, he was, just, he was just crazy. So he decided one day, I'm a tried prophet of God. He was actually trying God. It's not, he said, I'm going to try, try this prophet, see if he's real. He stood before the prophet. Thank you. He stood before the prophet, and the prophet answered him. Not the way he wanted to be answered, but he answered him and stuff. We want to make sure that when we stand before God, that our character is, if not pure, but it being, it at least being worked on, so God won't have to answer us in the frustration of our presentation. Amen? Here we goes. Isn't God worthy? He is certainly worthy. I'm almost there. Just give me a couple more minutes. Verse 8 says, He said, I will turn against such people, huh? and make a terrible example of them. Uh, listen to this. Now, 
I, I, I want to ask anybody this, and raise your hand if you ever heard this. Anybody, has anybody ever heard the phrase, sinning away the day of grace? Anybody ever heard that phrase? Yes. There are a lot of people in the body of Christ that don't believe that it can happen. Those who are uh, once saved, always saved people, those who are eternal security people believe that there's nothing you can do to go to hell. Once you get saved, once you confess, you say, no matter what you do and stuff. Now, we can, we can rescue ourselves through repentance. If we sin, we make a mistake, we get in error and stuff, certainly God to take us back. But ask me a question. If once saved, always saved and stuff is due to God loving us, tell me how, tell me, tell, show me where God didn't love Israel. No, there's no scripture that said God didn't love Israel. Matter of fact, he warned us, don't you get, don't you get, don't, don't you kick your heels up and, and stuff just because you didn't graft it, uh, you didn't graft it in. He says, because I ain't forgot the first branch. So he warns us not to think that's why this replacement theory is, is a whole lot of messed up mess. I don't know if anybody ever heard of replacement theory. There's two kinds of replacement theories going. One, one replacement theory, and I'm going to say it on here, and somebody, somebody may, I may, may lose, if anybody was listening, may not listen to me no more after I say this. One replacement theory is, is this. There are a group of people who call themselves the black Israelites who believe that they are replacing the original Jews. And so they're carrying on as if the Jews will never, won't be saved, mm -hmm. no matter what Revelation says. Mm -hmm. And so they won't be saved because they'll replace them. Then there's another replacement theory that's carried on by white supremacists. Mm -hmm. Or people pretending not white supremacists, but support that theory. Mm -hmm. In that, that they have to do what they can to kill out the minorities. Yes. Whether it be through guns, yes. through a disenfranchisement, uh, through some kind of suppression or oppression. Or get them back to even mentally thinking that they can be slaves again. Mm -hmm. Come on. Because they think that what's trying to happen is, is that the white people are being replaced by minorities, especially people of color. Yes. So see, there's two kind of replacement theories. Both are messed up. Both are messed up. Amen? Amen. All right. Verse 9 says, Again, Ezekiel 14, verse 9 says, And if a prophet is deceived, I need you to hear this one. This blew my mind. He says, verse 9 says, And if a prophet is deceived into giving a message, it is because I, the Lord, have deceived that prophet. Let me tell you something. Let me show you something. When bad characters or characteristics in a believer cannot be changed through conviction and truth, they may stand before a prophet. Here, they may stand before a prophet. And that prophet gives a message because God has released a deception for that prophet to give a message. And they will walk away from that message thinking it came from God and be discouraged. Has it ever happened in scriptures? Mm -hmm. Yes. Who will cause Ahab to fall? And a, and a, and a, and a, and a spirit came before God says, I will. Mm -hmm. I will. He volunteered. He said, well, how will you call Ahab, Ahab to fall? He said, I'll be a lying spirit in the mouth of his prophets. See, whenever we don't deal with our characteristic character and we come before God not being real, not being genuine, not dealing with or walking in uh, according to what he's convicted us about and stuff, we susceptible to be, find ourselves standing for, before prophets that God has allowed a lying spirit to rest in their mouth. He says, if they give a message, if a prophet gives a message, verse 9, he said, if a prophet and if a prophet is deceived into giving a message, it is because I, the Lord, have deceived that prophet, and I will lift my fist against such prophets and cut them off from the community of Israel. Yeah. What is all this? What, what, Pastor, why are you bringing this up? Because it sounds like, sound like it's kind of mad. No, I'm telling you, y'all, character means everything. Spiritual character means everything. It creates genuineness and truth in us. It creates your achievements in us, especially spiritual achievements in us. Verse 10 says this. I'm almost there. False prophets and those who seek their guidance will all be punished for their sins. Y'all, let me say this, and I, I'm, I'm going to be very direct with this. If we know that we are not doing what we ought to be doing, never stand before someone expecting God to contradict his rules of spiritual conduct. Amen? If I know I'm not right, I'm going to come before God, before those who can pray for me, for the help of what I'm not doing right with. Not to excuse me and stuff past what I'm not doing right. Verse 11 says this, 
In this way, the people of Israel will learn not to stray from me, polluting themselves with sin. They will be my people, and I will be their God. I, the sovereign Lord, has spoken this. Isn't that awesome? Amen. Even in all of this, y'all, where we see Israel's character being changed, turned, and transformed into something that God cannot use, God still shows them in the Old Testament an attitude of mercy and grace. Closing on this. I got this, this thing you doing. This is this. I'm going to read something to you right quick, then I'm going to come in. But God gives him, talking about Ezekiel in Ezekiel 14. And this is what I'm coming in. God gives them their real character. They were invested into things that you are. They were invested in things that would lead them to sin and did, did, and did only consult Ezekiel. Let's say this. And did only consult Ezekiel as they would, as they did the false objects of the worship or as they consulted or reached for or called on the passion that leads to their sin or to gratify their curiosity, desire, and passion. They disregarded the fact that their heart was already sold out to their bondage, to their struggles, to their fear, to their doubt, to the rebellion, to the deception and stubbornness and appeal to the prophet to, be, to, in, to encourage and reveal to them about the things of God. Wow. You know, one of the things that I pulled out from here is, um, I, and, and the Lord kind of sung that in my heart, is that there's a seriousness about serving God that I don't think the body of Christ, and I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about how your face look, you know how you, serious, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about y'all, the seriousness of serving God is that we realize how in jeopardy our soul can be if we intentionally, this is the operative word, Brother Jamar, if we intentionally miss it. I, I didn't say if we, whether through ignorance, through weakness, through bad choices, but lacking knowledge or strength. I'm not saying not that. None of those qualify what I just said. But what does qualify is despite knowledge, despite conviction, despite understanding, all those kind of things, we still make the kind of choices that lead to the kind of behavior that offends God. That makes our character come before God like, God, I just want, I just want you to bless me. I don't want nothing else from you. I just want you to bless me. I, I, I remember, and this is public knowledge because he said, he said it to us out loud. Uh, Bishop Copeland, we was talking to him one time. He said he was holding a prayer line. And a woman came up to the prayer line, and Bishop said, "What you want?" She said, "I just want you to bless me." She didn't want. She didn't want. She didn't want to be convicted by the message. She didn't want to make any changes. She didn't want to repent over anything. She didn't want to deal with any bitterness. She didn't want to deal with anything that was in her heart that was getting in the way of her receiving the things that God had promised her. She just want God to bless her. So many times, y'all, we think God is like UPS. God, I don't care who you are, where you live at, just give me the package. The Lord responds after when they were when, when they came to Ezekiel asking, he said, The Lord responds, I'm still in the same pre same area I'm getting that I'm pulling out from. The Lord responds, Should I should I be required of at all by them? He's asking this question. He said, Should I accept uh, the inquiries as an honor to myself? This is what God is saying. He said, Should I accept their inquiries as an honor to myself? Should I see it as a as a position? of wanting to worship or serve me. Jesus. Or answer them for satisfaction to them. Then he says, no. They have no reason to expect it. Hey, listen to this. They have no reason to expect it. For they have laid all these things deep into their hearts and have given them great influence in their affections that there is no parting from them. Listen, it, we are seeing here that God could not and would not answer them because what was between him and them was their investment in the things that caused them to sin and rebel against his will in their life. Mm -hmm. They came to inquire of the prophet acting as if they had put away their idols, but it was in their pretense only. They still had a secret reserve for them. They kept them up in their hearts and if they left them for a while, 
it was kuno umo revolti, which is intention to return to them in a final farewell. Y'all, when we come before God, our character should always be God. If I find myself weak, it's because I haven't attached to your strength. But not that I mean to walk in this weakness forever and make an excuse, but God, I need you in every step of my life. And I need you to teach me how to apply the strength of your steps yes. that I won't find myself presenting to you as if I don't want to Amen. or as if this is a plan of rebellion. Amen. It's character, y'all, that gets God's attention. It's who we, who we are defined. It's what our tree says we are. Again, if the tree bears no fruit, what kind of tree are we? What kind of tree are we? Now, it's easy to try to define it as just because there is no fruit. But you can't just define it because just there is no fruit. You have to also look, why is there no fruit? What's keeping it from having no fruit? Amen. What is this position behind no fruit? What is the attitude? Uh, um, because they don't have any fruit. So it doesn't, it's, it's easy to say, well, not a tree. Mm -hmm. Or whatever, rebellious, disconnected. It's not just that simple. We'll talk about it as time goes on. Amen? Amen. Let's all stand. God wants to make us all fruitful. And let me see this, and it's something I wrote when we did uh, a message a while back that almost dealt with something like this. Remember, God never talks to us about personal exposing to ourselves to make ourselves feel ashamed or embarrassed. Amen. But he always exposes us to us. The others won't use it against us, neither the enemy, to bring us down. Amen. 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 Remember when I use this illustration, if, I, if something is coming, if I get ahead of it, then when it does come out, I am dealt with it. Amen. That's all God wants to do. Get it out in front of you so you can deal with it. So when it does come out, pff, I don't already dealt with that. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your truth. All we want to do is, Father God, apply every truth and purpose and investment that you placed in our life. We stand before you today, God, with our whole hearts, God, and everyone that's listening, stand before you today. And, Father God, everything in my life that caused my character to be unsavory before you, that causes my life presentation, Father God, to not be acceptable to you, Father God, that causes my life, Father God, to invite contradictions even by my own self, God, I repent and renounce it, Lord. Father God, I ask that, Father God, that your season of deliverance, breakthrough, change, and turnaround, Father God. And, Lord, Father God, the mortifying, Father God, of my life and every issue, yes. Lord, Father God, every, every part of my life, my body, Lord, my soul, my flesh, God, my mind, my thinking, God, my attitude, God, to mortify, to put it to death, God, not to just sleep, but kill it, God. Yes. I submit to you, Father God, for the killing of that, Father. And, Lord, I ask that, Father God, from this day forward, that every step, God, be ordered by you. And that, Father, God, every moment, Lord, and, and necessity of deliverance, God, that I would recognize it as you begin to orchestrate that new thing in me, God. And I will realize and walk in that change. God, I pray for those who are weakened, those, Father, God, who the enemy is convinced that they're not coming out, that there's no change for them. I rebuke that lie of the enemy, God. I pray that, Lord, Father, God, you revive their minds, their spirit, their zeal, their hope, God. Lord, Father, that help that they reach out to you is real and that you will manifest that hope, God. Lord, I thank you, God, for every breakthrough and deliverance, God, that this message will bring to those who listen, God. And, Lord, I pray, Lord, as we begin again, according to your leading, as we continue this message, continue this teaching, that you would bring deliverance, hope, and help, God, to those who are reaching out to you, Father. We don't want to be underachievers. We don't want to offend you, God. We don't want to offend your grace or your mercy. Lord, we want to accept it, walk in it, Father God, and be empowered by it. And we decree this, God, in Jesus' name. And God, before we end this prayer, we pray, Lord, for those in Texas who've lost children, God. We pray for those families, God. We pray that, Lord, Father God, that you heal, deliver, and comfort, God, in the only way you can, God. Lord, I'm not, I'm not going to put any fancy words on it, God, because you're the only one, God, that can bridge this gap. 
And Father God, I pray for all our children, God, in every school uh, uh, system, God, in our country, in this world, God. We bind this demon, God, that's coming after our young people, God. Not just with guns, but with depression and suicide, God. Trying to, Lord Father God, disconnect them, Father God, and make them, Father God, feel like not a part of. Or, Lord Father God, not make them feel attached or feel that life is worth anything. I bind that demon now in Jesus' name. And I pray, God, your deliverance. I pray your help and hope, not just on these young people, but on their family. Not just on our children, but on our families, God. I pray for mothers and fathers, Father God, that have gone through this but survived, God, but limping while they're surviving because they did not get the answers. No one talked to them about the answers, God, of help, hope, God, deliverance, and healing, God. I pray for every spirit of depression that's traveling down through any family line, God, trying to destroy these children, trying to destroy these babies, Lord. I rebuke that now in Jesus' name. And I do, God. I do, Lord, with aggression and wholeheartedness come against every racist demon that's trying to wipe out, God, the minority race, God, that's trying to, Father God, feel that, Lord, and get, even those that get, get aggravated or get offended when we say black life matters. Let me say this, Lord, in my prayer, that no one is saying when we say black life matters that we're saying that no other life matters. What we need to understand is that if something is broken, you don't go and fix everything else. When it's not broken, you fix the thing that's broken. And what we're realizing is that there's something broken in this nation when it comes to black people, when it comes to people of minority. And we pray to that demon that's trying to psychologically, that's trying to physically, that's trying to spiritually bring black people into an atmosphere or a phase of fear, in a phase, Father God, of feeling less than. I rebuke that demon right now in Jesus' name. And every demon that's trying to cause a race war, every demon, Father God, that's trying to call, Father God, a war of division in this country, I bind it right now in Jesus' name. And I, Lord Father God, I would dare not leave, even hostile that blacks are having against blacks. I rebuke that spirit now in Jesus' name. The mean mugging, the hatred, the distrust, God. Lord Father, the crab-like mentality, God, that's even in existence, Father God, even in our own race, I bind that in Jesus' name. The destructing spirit, Father God, that's trying to make us kill our own selves, I rebuke that in Jesus' name. Father, help us to bind together as a people that realize there's a common God obstruction. There's something, Father God, that's out there that's trying to suck away the life, Father God, of every African American, and not just men, but women, children, Father God, babies, God. We rebuke that now in Jesus' name. And again, God, I take authority over the spirit of abortion. I'm not just talking about killing a babies in the wombs. I'm talking about killing a babies after they come out the womb. I rebuke that spirit of abortion, God. I bind it now in Jesus' name. And that spirit of rejection that has us aggressive one against another, I bind that demon right now in Jesus' name, God. And I release your healing and your deliverance, God. And again, God, I bind any demon that tries to speak in the ears of those that may hear this and think that this is a racist prayer I rebuke that demon I bind you now for coming against my cause my words to be misunderstood mis- be misconstrued I rebuke that in Jesus name and I pray God that Lord the numbness that is over the hearts and minds of many in this country that refuse to see what's going on I bind that demon as well in Jesus name God I pray and we thank you God amen and amen